So this first little picture that you can see is the cardiology team as well as the anesthesia team. We all look nice and happy. We've just completed a balloon valvoplasty. And this little cool dude here, wonderful little guy, um, has just had a balloon valvoplasty for the most common cardiac condition that we see here at the Ralph. Okay, all went really well, I'll let you know, so it's all good news. Okay, okay. so the most common cardiac congenital cardiac condition that we see in dogs is pulmonic stenosis. Um, and I believe it's one of the most common congenital conditions that they see in all the cardiology centers. There are predisposed, predisposed predis uh, breeds, um, but they can occur in any dog. The most common breeds that we see with this condition um, is your small dogs, your terriers, uh, your West Highland Whites, your Cocker Spaniels, so all kind of the small breeds. It can occur in the larger breeds dogs, namely the Labradors and the Boxers, but generally the small terrier breeds. The picture that I have, of course, the Bulldogs always have problems. And these Bulldogs present other challenges. They have pulmonic stenosis, not the classic pulmonic stenosis. They have different <coughs> types, really complicated, really challenging cases. They have something, not all of them, but sometimes they can have something called an aberrant coronary artery, which basically means there's the, uh, coming off from the left coronary artery, there's a branch that wraps around the pulmonary artery, causing a stricture, causing a strangulation of the um, pulmonary artery. And so in these cases, they're really, really challenging. Um, the procedure that we normally recommend is a balloon valvoplasty, but when these bulldogs have these aberrant coronary arteries, it's generally contraindicated. If we did balloon these dogs that have got aberrant coronary arteries, we can either compress that coronary artery or we can rupture that coronary artery. And obviously that's fatal for our patients and we really don't want to do that. Cats, cats can have pulmonic stenosis, but it's quite uncommon, it's quite rare. And if they do, they tend to have other congenital defects along with the pulmonic stenosis. Bearing in mind, any animal that comes to us in the cardiology department, if they have a, a congenital disease, we are also looking for other congenital defects. Cats, namely, will have other congenital defects alongside the pulmonic stenosis. Okay. So, what is pulmonic stenosis? So, it's caused by stenosis of the pulmonic valve, um, but it can also be subvalvular or supravalvular. There are different types. There's type A, there's type B, and there's mixed. So type A is the pulmonic stenosis that we uh, quite like to see because it's easy to balloon. It's easy to burst open those valves. So type A has got a normal annulus of the pulmonary artery and it has partially fused valve leaflets. Type B is where you have a dysplastic valve, so they haven't developed properly, and also you have um, a hypoplastic, so an undeveloped pulmonary artery. They're more challenging. And then, I, then again, I mentioned the bull type dogs, the bull breeds, they'll have a mixed type. So they're in a law unto themselves. They can have type A, they can have type B, they can have aberrant coronary arteries, they can have a whole mixture. So I know bull breeds and bull dogs present challenging cases for all other disciplines, and they really are quite challenging for the cardiologists as well. So what happens with pulmonic stenosis? So the stenotic valve causes the pressure overload of the right ventricle, resulting in right ventricular hypertrophy. So what does that mean? Well, basically, as you know, if you work any muscle really hard, so you're working this right ventricle really hard because it's working across a stenotic component. Any muscle that you work really hard is going to get thickened and it's become hypertrophied. So this is what happens with pulmonic stenosis. Okay. Um, pulmonic stenosis causes reduced blood flow to the lungs, resulting in poor blood oxygenation. So what you all know, the blood comes into the right side goes into the lungs to become oxygenated. But if you've got a stenotic component on that right side in the pulmonary artery, there's reduced blood flow um, to the lungs, and so the, the, therefore there's poor blood oxygenation. If this happens, sometimes you can get carers that will um, comment and say they've, the, their animal has got reduced exercise intolerance, so they've noticed they're not able to exercise as much. Or in cases of puppies, they're able to exercise, but then they get really quite tired, a bit abnormal for puppies. Um, you can also get carers that bring in their um, animals to say that actually there's been a collapse event or there's been a syncopal event. And this tends to happen because of the poor blood oxygenation. 
Um, if left untreated, so if pulmonary stenosis is not treated, um, and especially in severe cases, it can progress to right-sided heart failure. So these animals present quite severely um, collapsed. They have ascites. They might have um, um, hepatic, increased hepatic pressures. Um, and also, sadly, they can actually present with quite severe cardiac arrhythmias as well. So it is really, really essential to diagnose pulmonary stenosis and get it treated. Okay, so how do we diagnose pulmonary stenosis? So everyone in general practice, I'm sure you see lots of puppies and kittens as well, but generally puppies that come in for their first vaccinations and on auscultation. So the carers may say, yeah, they have no concerns. You go ahead and you do your physical examination and then you listen for a murmur. So hopefully everyone here is listening to murmurs. Yeah, it's really, really important. I know quite often in clinics, it's the vets that listen, but us nurses, we can get listen to these murmurs. The more murmurs you listen to, uh, the more you're going to be able to pick up abnormal murmurs because you're generally, hopefully in general practice, you're going to be listening to all normal animals. That's what we want. So when you hear abnormal, something sounds abnormal, hopefully you'll pick that up a lot quicker. Now with pulmonic stenosis, the murmur sounds quite harsh, harsh, sorry, and it's heard at the very base of the heart. So typically when you listen to a heart murmur, you'll always listen where you can feel the prominent apical beat and that's the apex of the heart. And yes, you can definitely get murmurs there, but for pulmonic stenosis, you need to listen and you need to move your stethoscope much more uh, cranially towards the base of the heart. And that's where you will hear a pulmonic stenosis murmur. And this is why sadly sometimes this murmur or this condition is not picked up. We do have animals that come in with quite severe pulmonic stenosis because the murmur hasn't been picked up. So if you take anything away from this talk, please everyone listen to murmurs, listen to the apex and listen cranially to the base of the heart as well to be able to pick up this specific murmur. Okay. Um, the intensity of the heart murmur usually correlates with the severity of the stenosis. So obviously we grade murmurs one to six, one being the quietest, six being the loudest. And pulmonary stenosis can normally range from about grade three up into grade six. Um, so yeah, the, the severity is generally does correlate with the severity of the stenosis. As I said, carers may present their little puppies or even their adult dogs and they've got no clinical signs whatsoever and they're completely bamboozled by the fact you're telling them they've got this murmur and what it could mean. Um, other other um, patients can arrive with exercise intolerance and it can be really, really subtle. You know, there may be nothing obvious at all or there could be syncopal events or sadly signs of like, um, congestive heart failure. So what we do here at the Ralph, we have a specific clinic for puppies and kittens, okay? Um, I don't know if you've all heard of it, but we do um, encourage puppies with heart murmurs to come in and have an echocardiography, which is a scan of the heart. It's the only way that we can assess what the condition is, what this murmur is, and what's causing the murmur. Uh, echocardiography is very straightforward. We don't generally, 99% of our patients, even puppies and kittens, we don't sedate. We try not to sedate. If we do sedate, it's generally because it's for the animal's best interest, because they're really, really anxious and really nervous. But we have all the tricks of the trade. Um, we have treats, you know, licky licks. We, we do everything to keep our animal nice and calm. Um, I talk to them. I cuddle them on the table. You know, they're all reassured. And it's literally a 20 minute scan. We have to, uh, clip both sides of the chest to be able to perform the echocardiography because um, hairy, hairy animals is not conducive with putting the probe on. Um, but it's a highly sensitive diagnostic tool in checking uh, for pulmonary stenosis or other congenital conditions and also the severity of pulmonary stenosis. Okay, so you can all see this. This is, um, can we stop that just for a minute? Amazing. So I don't know if any of you are particularly familiar with the anatomy of a scan of a picture of a, of a heart, but if I don't want to get in anyone's way, but this is your left side. So this is your left ventricle here. This is your left atrium and this is your mitral valve. And then the top, you have your right ventricle, your right atrium and your tricuspid valve. So we can play that. So the right ventricle should be a third of the size of the left ventricle, okay? So instantly when I look at this image, I can see that this right ventricle is hypertrophied. It's quite thick. Really, it, it, you really don't generally notice the right ventricle on this um, long axis um, scan of the heart. Um, so when we see this, the top differential is going to be 
pulmonistenosis. Okay. Do you want to play that once? Yep, perfect. Yeah, everyone happy with that? Cool. Okay. Yes, please, thank you. Okay. So, classification of pulmonary stenosis. So, as I said, we have types A, B, and mixed. But on echocardiography, what we also want to do is we want to have a look at the pressure gradient across that pulmonic valve. You do get flow across the pulmonic valve, of course you do, but we want to have a look at the pressure gradient. So if it's less, less than 50 millimetres of mercury, it's a mild stenosis. So generally those animals can go on and live a normal life. We would recommend repeated um, echocardiography just to make sure that that stays, because as if it's a puppy, it can progress as they get older. 50 to 80 millimetres of mercury is classed as a moderate stenosis. And then greater than 80 is severe stenosis, okay? Um, a BVP, so a balloon valvuloplasty, which is a cardiac intervention, is recommended for moderate and severe. But if they've got clinical signs, so if they've got arrhythmias, signs of congestive heart failure, or they've got exercise intolerance, then we will also recommend a balloon valvuloplasty. <laughs> ah, okay, so I'm just going to describe a balloon valvoplasty. This is one of our wonderful PCAs here with one of our patients, the guy, that you, the cool dude that you saw in the first photograph. So he had his intervention just on Wednesday. It all went wonderfully. It was picture perfect. It was really good. But I just wanted to explain what we do here. So you can see there's vet wrap. It seems to be an awful lot of vet wrap around the chest and then a lead coming off. So for all our cardiac interventions, we use transthoracic pacing pads. And then that cable is attached to a life pack. Now, this is just precautionary. It is just in case the animal during the procedure becomes severely bradycardic, um, has you know, ventricular fibrillation, or we have a cardiac arrest. So rather than having to stop you know, the field, the uh, sterile field, we can transphrastically pace with our pacing pads. We don't have to then become unclean and then start to um, do CPR. We've got our pacing pads in place, ready to intervene if we need to. Um, it all sounds very technical. I can't remember the last procedure. I think in all my years of doing cardio, we've had to use transphrastic pacing once in a balloon valvoplasty. So it's quite rare, it's precautionary, but it's good to have that on board. Anesthesia always have a go at the cardio team because we put the vet back really, really tightly and then it really interferes with all their parameters. So we always work really, really close with the anesthesia team to make sure we haven't tied that too tightly around the patient. But yeah, that's our lovely little guy that had his intervention on um, Wednesday. So as I said, treatment of pulmonic stenosis is a procedure called a balloon valvoplasty. It's mini minimally invasive and we just go via the jugular. So there's no surgical cut down, there isn't anything like that. We just use introducers, catheters and wires that go into the right jugular. So it's a huge clip that we do um, for the procedure. So that takes longer than the procedure sometimes, having to do the clip. And then we also will clip the femoral vein as well, just in case we can't catheterize the right jugular or there is no right jugular. Believe it or not, there are some patients that have no right jugular. So we do, but we do all in preparation. As I said, it's minimally invasive. Um, various catheters advance into the right side of the heart via the jugular vein. It's all done in theatre, and we use fluoroscopy guidance and geography is performed. So that I'll show you the Im images now because it's really, really cool. And then what we will do, we will in, um, insert a special interventional balloon that goes across the pulmonic valve to burst open those valve leaflets and hopefully palliate the condition. I haven't mentioned before, but a balloon valvoplasty for pulmonic stenosis is palliative. It's not curative. So we can never get the patient back to normality, we just palliate the condition. Okay, thank you. Okay, so this is, a, I think this is a really cool image. So this is an angiography of that dog's heart, that you, the dog that you've just seen. And you can see, I hope it's clear for everyone, you can see a catheter coming into the right side of the heart. Okay, and it stops here, and I'll show you another image in a moment. But then it injects <coughs> contrast via fluoroscopy into the right side of the heart. And what we're looking for is we're looking for the stenotic component. So can you see, this is the pulmonary artery. This is, sorry, this is the right, um, right ventricular outflow tract, the pulmonary, um, pulmonic valve, and this is the pulmonary artery. You can see where there's an indentation here. Okay, so that's the stenotic lesion. That's where we want to place our balloon across that stenotic lesion to burst open those valves. What's really, really interesting about this is the post-stenotic dilation. Can you see that huge, huge bulge? 
that shouldn't be there. So normally the pulmonary artery will follow this line, but because this little guy had such a pressure gradient across this pulmonic valve, and there was such an intensity of the blood flow, it caused this massive big dilation here. Okay, so I just wanted to put that image up because I think I have never seen a post-sonotic dilation that big before. And of course, with that massive sonotic dilation, there is a risk of um, rupture. So, okay. <coughs> Ha, this is cool. Right, so um, this is a catheter that comes into the right side of the heart. This is a balloon catheter. So we have two dots. Can you see the two dots? Hopefully everyone can see the two dots. Okay, so those two dots guide us. In between these two dots is a balloon catheter, a special balloon catheter that will go... And obviously because the previous image that we've done shows us where the stenotic component is. We have two screens. Um, and then once we dilate this balloon, which we will do now, there we go, that's the balloon dilation. That's the sonotic component. And what we want is for that waste to go. We can continue. Yeah, thank you, sorry. Let's do that again. So you can see in a moment, hopefully. There we go. Cool. Uh, and that's what we want. That's textbook, textbook perfect balloon valvoplasty on that dog that we've just seen. It doesn't always happen like that. Sometimes the balloon, as you can imagine, we're going into a heart that's beating, which is a good thing. We want the heart to beat. But as you can imagine, the balloon catheter is moving with every beat of that heart. It's moving around and we have to, you know, the, the cardiologists have to keep a firm grip of these catheters. So this balloon didn't move much, but in some interventions, the balloon catheter will go up into the, the distal part of the pulmonary artery um, and it can cause us all manner of problems but this was perfect so I wanted to show you this is the textbook how we do it and this is what we want um, so this balloon once it's deflate, defl um, inflated we deflate very very slowly you can imagine by inflating this balloon across the pulmonary artery we have now occluded the outflow tract so anesthesia we work very very closely with anesthesia they give us a hard time because we have now dropped this dog's <coughs> pressures there is no output they're really quite you know they're like telling us there's no pressures in this dog so we have to sit and wait we do get obviously with these wires and these catheters we're tickling the heart the heart doesn't want to be tickled and we're tickling the heart with all these catheters so we get ventricular arrhythmias but we have an amazing anesthesia team that's you know stays nice and calm they give lidocaine they give antiarrhythmics whenever we need it and they tell us just hang fire for a minute please stop ballooning so we'll deflate the balloon and we sit and wait anesthesia give us the go ahead and then we do another balloon dilation just to make sure we've completely ruptured that valve and we've burst it open. So it's all a bit technical, you know, it's all a bit tense at times, but as long as we work closely with the anesthesia team, we're all good. So that's a, yeah, that's a really good example to show you. Okay, thank you. There we go. We can show that again. Yeah. And we're all so relieved when we see that, the waste of the balloon go. Yeah. Oh, it's amazing. Okay. <laughs> Okay, yeah, next one. Okay, so this is courtesy of Luca and Heidi Ferrison. They're the um, uh, cardiologists that I work with here. And they very kindly loan me the images. Okay, so this one is... Stop, yeah, amazing. Thank you. So this is the first part of the procedure that we do. We um, insert a balloon. Um, this is a Berman catheter, sorry. It's got um, a little um, balloon on the end. Now, this balloon, as I said, helps us keep the heart in place. Because as I said before, the heart's moving. You know, there's lots of pressure in the heart. So this balloon here sitting on the end of the Berman angiographic catheter helps us keep that catheter in place. And then we inject contrast. And as you can see, you just saw that happen. It injects the contrast. Um, and here, it's not as clear on this one. It's a bit blurry, but the stenotic component is there. So once we've got that image and the cardiologists are happy that we've got the perfect place of the stenotic component, we transfer it to another image. So that stays on that screen and then we continue with um, the angiography on the other screen. Thank you. And this is obviously done all under fluoroscopic guidance. So I just wanted to show you this because this shows you how tricky it is sometimes to get the catheters in place. So this is a catheter, this is uh, yet again the Berman, and then you can see what looks like a worm coming out, that's a guide wire, so that's a, catheter, uh, a wire that we use to help place all the catheters in place. But you can see sometimes they flick around, they don't go in the place that we want to go, there we go. So yeah, it can be quite frustrating, it can take us a while to get the catheters in place. Now, so this is another balloon dilation, so if we could just stop there again, sorry Julia, thank you. Um, we've got the two dots somewhere yeah there and there 
which shows us where our balloon is. So don't forget, we've got the image on the other side that shows us where our synoptic component is. We've now got this image that shows us where our balloon catheter is in place, and then we inflate. There we go. And then you can see the waste, and it bursts. Yeah, can we play that again? Would that be OK? Beautiful. Look at that. Perfect. Wonderful. So that's what we do in the, in the cath lab with our um, pulmonic stenosis animals. Perfect. Thank you, Julia. I never tire of seeing that. <laughs> oh, we're going. There we go. So, post procedure. Normally, the recovery is really uneventful. You know, they normally recover really well. Um, so, as I said, there's no surgical site. So, once we remove all the catheters and the introducers and all the equipment that we have um, to uh, monitor anas uh, the anesthesia, we literally put pressure, we apply pressure on the um, juggler site for 20 minutes, and that's all we do. That's all that's needed. It's really, really um, non invasive. Uh, we always put our patients back into ICU uh, just because we can get them to be looked after for sort of just 24 hours. Uh, we do ask that they're kept nice and calm because if we've got a puppy that's really excitable, there is a risk that this um, juggler vein may start bleeding again. If that happens, just apply pressure, but we do want to keep them nice and calm. Our wonderful anaesthesia team will probably dot them up for um, some form of sedation just to keep them a little bit calmer for the first 24 hours. We recommend, actually, we're quite strict, we say no leads or collars because if you're putting a lead or a collar over that jugular site it can promote more bleeding from the jugular so it's harnesses only we get them to carry them out to toilets so literally really we do want them nice and calm no juggler sticks because we've just used the jugular so to prevent any confusion you don't get anywhere near the jugular for a while because we obviously have caused a little bit of trauma to that jugular we ask that regular checks on the juggler wound. So post procedure, we just put a primapore on the site so we can see for strike through. Um, and then we just get that checked regularly in the ICU department for 24 hours. And then they go home the following day. So we speak to the carers um, and explain that they need to be kept nice and quiet for the first um, two weeks, generally we recommend. Uh, crate train, <coughs> crates if possible, um, just to keep them nice and calm. Um, but then after that, they can go back to their normal routine, normal life. Carers do, even though they come and say that they're asymptomatic, actually post-procedure, they turn around and say, oh my God, I didn't realise actually how quiet my puppy was. We tend to give them a new lease of life after this because we're improving that blood oxygenation once we burst open that valve. We do like to see them back in three to four weeks. During the procedure of the balloon valvoplasty, we do check <coughs> intracardiac pressures. So we do check that pressure gradient. But as you can imagine, we've got catheters in the heart, they're tickling the heart, we've caused a little bit of inflammation. So they're not always true figures. We do get an idea that we've been successful, but we don't always get the true figures. Three to four weeks later, we repeat the scan and hopefully then we've reduced the pressure gradient. And then if they're puppies, we get them back a year later because then they're fully grown, we know exactly what's going on, and then hopefully then we can give the carers good news that we have reduced this pressure gradient and hopefully they can go on to live a full and normal life. Okay. So, what we deem a success. So the balloon valvoplasty intervention typically, typically results in a reduction of the pressure gradient across the stenotic valve by 50%. As I said, it's palliative, it's not curative. But if we can reduce the pressure gradient by 50%, so what it starts at, by 50% or even more, then that's success for us. And that's what everyone aims for. And, and that, oh, I should mention, then obviously it gives a, long, a good long-term clinical outcome. And that's the main, that's the main objective of us. Okay. So I just want to mention something um, which is really, really cool. Um, so we are one in three centres, I believe, in Europe that are now offering a stent procedure. So as I mentioned, these bulldogs that give us really, really challenging cases, they've got an aberrant coronary artery that we can't balloon because we don't want to rupture that coronary artery, or they've got <coughs> hyperplastic coronary arteries that ballooning doesn't work. We can now, in collaboration with a human cardiologist, offer stents. We have performed four here. They are absolutely phenomenal and they're amazing to be a part of. Um, and it's also helping 
um, these dogs, you know, these challenging cases, we can do something about it. We can hopefully improve their life. And also, it's, it's cardiology, it's progressing, it's, you know, new technology, it's groundbreaking. So, but that's, I could talk for hours about it. It's another talk for another time. Um, but yeah, just to let you know that this is something that we are now doing here at the Ralph. Okay. And then there's some cool pictures of us working really, really hard in the in the in theatre. Um, as always, we tend to have a bit of fun because it gets a bit tense at times. But yeah, this is um, part of our team. Uh, thank you for listening. I hope you found it interesting, and I'm open to any questions.